Welcome to the Factories Immigration and Nativist Study Guide. By the 1840s and 1850s, factories had become the dominant work environment in America. Most of the people in the large cities were working in the factories. Working conditions in these factories were very difficult. People worked very long hours, anywhere from 12 to 16 hour days, usually six days a week. Pay was low. Living conditions were very poor. Many times people were crammed into tenements, which are small apartments, and you could have sometimes six, eight, ten people living in a single studio or one bedroom apartment. When they were at work, the factories had limited ventilation, which means there was not a lot of airflow. And with the mills, there was a lot of fibers that were flying around in the air that were being breathed in by the workers because there was no ventilation system to clean out the air or to keep fresh air coming through. Few of the factories had heating systems, and those that did usually had some kind of a pot-bellied stove that would sit over in the corner or sometimes down the middle of the room, but the heat from those would only go a few feet, and so it didn't really warm the entire factory. So many of the workers were working in very cold conditions, and there was no air conditioning during the summer. The machines were also very unsafe. They did not have protective covers to keep you from getting your hand caught or your foot caught or your clothes caught. The machines had belts that would fly around and they'd break, they'd go flying off. It was a very dangerous environment to work in. And there were women, children, as well as the men that were working in these factories. It was very dangerous. To try to improve the working conditions in these factories, the skilled workers began to form what were called trade unions. Now, a trade union is an association of workers, a group of workers, that form to get better wages and working conditions for the employees. By working together, you have more power than a single person going in and asking for better working conditions. The trade union petitioned employers for higher wages, better working conditions, shorter hours, and one of the strategies that they often used when they were not having success getting the employers to give in to their demands was something called a strike. A strike is when the employees choose not to go in and do their work. The trade unions did win several victories. President Van Buren himself ordered that all government employees would work no more than a 10-hour day. Unfortunately, that 10-hour day didn't spread to the private sector, businesses owned by individuals or companies. In 1842, Massachusetts workers won the legal right to strike in court. Unfortunately for unskilled workers, they were very easily replaced. So they found it very difficult to bargain for better wages and conditions because if they went on strike, the employers would just hire someone else to come in and do their job. Because unskilled labor means it's a job that can be trained on the job. You don't have to have the training and knowledge before you are hired. Women also had a very difficult time organizing unions. Most of the men did not want the women in the unions. And because of society as a whole, women were considered to be less than men. It was assumed that they would be paid less. But the women were able to start organizing many successful protests. Things changed in the factories and in the cities in the 1840s and 1850s with the entrance of about 4 million immigrants to the United States. An immigrant is a person who moves to a new country to live. Most of the immigrants that came during this particular time period were from the countries of Ireland and Germany. The Irish, between 1840 and 1860, there were about one and a half million of them that fled something called the Irish potato famine. The potato crop was the major crop that was grown in Ireland. It was the money maker. It was what most families lived on. But there was some kind of a blight that means disease, that hit the potatoes and they were rotting in the ground. 
and people were losing their homes, they were losing their land, and they were forced to go somewhere else to try to find a way to survive. Almost two million of them decided that the place to go was America. Most of the Irish that came were not wealthy. They had come from this famine. They were short on money if they had any. Many of them used every penny they had just to get on the boats to get over here. So they settled in the cities and took the factory jobs at very, very low pay, very long hours. At least it was something coming in. The Germans, on the other hand, most of the Germans that came were fleeing an unsuccessful revolution that had just occurred in Germany. And those who had supported the revolution decided it was better to leave the country than to stay there. But they came with money. Most of the Germans had their savings. They had money with them. So they were able to move beyond the cities into the Midwest and buy farms. They also had other skills that they could offer some skilled laborers working in coal mines and working with iron that they had done when they were in Europe. All of these immigrants led to the beginning of what was called the nativist movement. Some Americans were against immigration and they formed this nativist group as a way to try to fight the immigration. Four million people coming in 10 to 20 years is a lot of people. The nativist people wanted to preserve the United States for native born, that means people who were born in the United States, white, and mostly Protestant religion. The nativists called for a cap on immigration. A cap means a limit on the number of people that would be allowed to immigrate or come to America every year. They also wanted all immigrants to be at least 21 years old before they could become a citizen. The nativists also argued that immigrants stole jobs from native-born Americans, raised the crime rate in the cities that they were living in, they were untrustworthy, and one of the worst things, they were Catholic. Most of our nativists were Protestant, and there had always been in Europe tensions between the Protestants and the Catholics. In Ireland today, there is still fighting going on between the Protestants and the Catholics. The nativists eventually formed their own political party. They were officially called the American Party, but they were nicknamed the Know Nothing Party. If you ask them anything about their political ideas or what went on in their meetings, they would say, oh, I know nothing. And so they became known as the Know Nothing Party. Many of the nativists believed that the American Party would replace the crumbled Whig Party that had fallen apart. In 1856, the American Party actually selected former President Millard Fillmore as their presidential candidate to run on their ticket. Although he didn't win, he did take over 21% of the vote. Nativism eventually took a back seat to the slavery issue, however, and it gradually faded out of prominence. It has not disappeared. We are still having the same arguments against immigration today, and we are still having some of the same reasons expressed as to why we needed to limit immigration even more. Now you know a little bit about factories, immigration, and know-nothings.